the subject, the subject of this talk is not about PureScript specifically, um, but about kind of making large applications in a purely functional programming language. Um, and like as like I started learning uh, purely functional languages like about four years ago, I started trying to learn Haskell. Um, <laughs> kind of skid off the top first because it's pretty dense. <laughs> and then uh, I came back a little bit later and I was able to get a little bit deeper by getting, um, uh, so yeah. But yeah. I finally, finally got into it about uh, two years ago and um, I started learning like all like the higher kind of types like the functors and monads and um, all the different abstract algebra. Like I, I learned all that just from PureScript first. Um, it was really challenging. There's like a lot of stuff to learn, right? Um, so like this kind of talk is targeted to all the people coming behind me who are kind of coming at PureScript uh, kind of like as their first experience into purely functional programming. Um, and then also like people who, people who are coming after me in the sense of kind of building larger programs, um, period. <laughs> because before, like my experience has been doing Salesforce development, uh, customizations for various companies, which consists of like writing database triggers, make, uh, using the provided UI widgets to, uh, to make a UI for you know, putting stuff in the database and taking it back out again and reviewing it, all this kind of stuff. It's very simple stuff relatively to this. Um, yeah, and then I got onto a big JavaScript project um, multiple pages. It's Angular 1. Um, and then I, I was working on that for like a year and a half and it was, it was fun for like the first six months. But we had no type checker. It was just vanilla JavaScript and Angular. And um, it was pretty awful. <laughs> it's like we were fixing dumb stuff. Like after the, after the first six months, like we were fixing dumb stuff. Like every week we'd be fixing like some null, null error thing in production. <laughs> like something wrong in production. They got push out the hot fix. It's like every week, it was driving me crazy. I suggested to my team, like, we should like at least get type, uh, TypeScript in here. It's like, we don't have to use all the advanced features, just get some basic stuff. And my team was like against it. They're like, I don't see the value of a type checker. And I think that was the first time in my life I ever felt my blood boil. <laughs> and it's happened a few times since then, so I hope, I hope you guys never ever have to have your blood boil. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, um, for people who might be interested in building large applications and um, are interested for more information about pure FP, um, yeah, I use the word context here. Uh, it's not like the word context, like Monad provides a context for various types. It's just like as a learner, as a user, it's like here's some additional information that maybe they don't tell you um, when you're learning purely, fu purely functional languages. Um, yeah. Um, that's about me. So, like for like the last two years, I've been working on like a personal project, building a um, uh, kind of like a, a website thing. It's got lots of different things. It's like you got a homepage, like a search search box, search results, um, item detail page, and like several other like marketing you know marketing style pages that uh, kind of tell them information about the project. Um, it gets bigger. Lots. You, know, you always find the need for one new page. Like, all right, let's have a page about me. Let's have a page about um, what this site is about. Let's have a page about, yeah, a bunch of static pages. But um, anyways, I didn't, know at the, I didn't know at the time I'd be needing all these different pages. Um, I just, uh, yeah, so anyways, I wanted to do it with PureScript. I knew that because I'm, I need a little bit of stuff on the, on the server side to serve like an API. And um, PureScript works good in the browser and the server, so why not like share some types? So I had to choose a front end thing, and I chose like the Pucks one. Um, I kind of came to regret that. Um, um, because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't scale to all the different pages you might want to have. And you got to do some additional thinking about how you want to do it. But at the time, I didn't know it. It's like, this looks easy. <laughs> I can do this. Yeah, so I started doing um, Puck stuff. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that maybe later. Can I just ask, what's, yeah. what's T? Oh, the Elm architecture. It's, it's the architecture thing that uh, uh, Puck implements. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. um, yeah. So like what drew me to pure FP in the first place is it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, like the parametric polymorphism, you're going to say for all A, A to whatever, right? It just works for so many different types. You can like, um, and if you look at all the, the core libraries of PureScript, they're quite beautiful, right? Like the validation library, there's like two functions and like a few instances of a type class. It's like, 
And then people are happy with this, right? Like, you only need these two functions, you can do all the validations you need. But, uh, and then you look at like other similar libraries in JavaScript and <laughs> you need a whole readme. It's like crazy. So yeah, it's kind of enticing, like the pure, like the pure FP style. Um, yeah, I mean, this is pretty, pretty, pretty great. Um, let's see. Yeah, and like the routing thing, like you can write some pretty concise code. Um, and because there's library, a library for it, you, you think, I, sh I should use this for sure. Um, you, like even without considering much else. It's like, I'll start with it and see how it goes. And that's fair. Um, yeah, and like, like the semi-group and, um, yeah. But like, like, like I said, I got, I got kind of uh, uh, into a spot where I was having a hard time uh, making changes because I had, in, like, I had a big you know, single page thing in Pucks like, in my front end like, to render all, all, my, all the pages. And then I had um, HTTP APIs to listen for uh, data requests, which I'd then take these and I'd put them in a database. So um, it gets kind of complicated, right? You have like the front end, the back end, and then I maybe talk to a web service or to the data database. It's, it's pretty complicated. It's kind of a big app, and it's all in the same language, and you can use the same types everywhere. So it's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I look at what the, if I look, look at the code I wrote, it doesn't look like the beautiful code <laughs> that you find in the libraries, like where you just have like a module with two functions and has everything. You know, you're just happy with it. Um, yeah. So I was kind of. Curious about like why that is. Um, like f for like I guess one reason is that like in a real application you're not going to have polymorphic types. So you're going to start from like uh, like your domain objects. If you'll have like a type called user, <laughs> right? Um, or you'll have like a type called profile or a type called asset or um, like a transaction, business transaction. Like you have concrete types. And then whenever you want to write functions, you write functions that work on that concrete type. Um, and that's great. It's like easily readable. And if you want to use like your function finder, uh, the question mark, uh, the, the type hold thing, like you can maybe have a chance at finding those. But if you start getting with uh, constraints and such like that, I'm, I, I don't know. But it's just harder to read code that has the constraints. And yeah, so I just didn't do it. I just want simple stuff that I know I can maintain. And I thought concrete types, we can do that. Um, Yeah, and like, and, and it's true that like for these libraries, these standard libraries, um, a lot of thought has been got, has gone into them about like what kind of laws they should have, and like like the functor and um, these things that you have laws, and you don't often think about that for like your own code, uh, for like real applications. You don't think about what laws like the user type has to obey, um, and I, like I'm kind of thinking like you should probably think more about that. But people don't like people like at a, at, a, at a conference like this at Lambda Conf. Um, like I don't hear people talking about that. I just hear, hear, hear people explaining like how the functors work and the applicatives, um, and like all these universal concepts that kind of work across all the different apps. I don't really hear what, what uh, uh, I don't really hear what uh, people say about how to write specific apps. I hear people how do you how, um, explain how to use how to use a specific library, which is nice and useful. Um, right. So like, is it wrong for me to like write concrete types and functions between all these different types and um, um, like maybe not. Like I, I was watching Edward Komet's Twitch stream because that's that's a thing now. People live stream themselves programming, and and uh, people are. And somebody asked him about um, uh, like his pro like his programming style. Like what is what his thought process is for making one of these libraries, like like the highly highly reusable lens library. And he said that um, oh no, I, I didn't make that as part of a specific project. Like I was kind of inspired by real world real world projects. But um, when it came down to it, I ended up just writing a separate library, and then later kind of rewriting, refactoring some of my work code such that it uses this lens, this, this lens library. And I think that's a very important thing to make note of, is that um, like these, like these re highly reusable libraries that functional, like, functional practitioners uh, advise you to use, um, they're not easy to come up with. <laughs> um, and once you do come up with them, you're probably going to have to go back and rewrite some of your code to kind of fit with what you've later discovered is a better practice. And it's, it's important to note that, that you, you'll, you won't get it right the first time. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so then I was, uh, so then I kind of got into the thinking pattern of what can I do with my real world application to make it more beautiful, more like the things I admire so much, these core libraries in the functional, you know, in the, pure, in the PureScript ecosystem. And well, at least like all the ones I admire are the ones with type classes and like a single function or like one or two functions. These, they're, they're very fine grained. Um, I wonder if I have the reasons here. Oh, my bullet points, marked down so hard. Um, right, and, so, and so, some of them, like, they, like a lot of them, they come from like the math community, right? That gives them like this mystical, um, that these must be awesome, I should use this ev everywhere. Um, and yeah, you know, maybe that's true, but um, yeah, and they're also relatively fine-grained. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can, you can kind of draw some, con some conclusions about what the, uh, uh, the uh, guiding principles are of these core, li core libraries. Um, it's it's ju ju just like I stated. Um, yeah, and like, like the most important f um, thing is uh, like the laws, like these type classes, they're not type checked per se without some sort of property based testing library, but the laws are like a big part of like, the, the why these um, core library functions are so beautiful. It's why they can stay so clean is it's just expected that instances obey certain laws. So how could we like make, how, how could we kind of take that and apply it to our own real world applications? is you're going to have to do a lot of thinking again, just like, um, like the author of like the Lens Library had to do a lot of thinking about what it means to be a lens. Um, and yeah, so like here's some examples of laws that you'd see in, in the PureScript prelude. Um, commutativity, associativity, distributivity. Like these kind of laws come from mathematics. Um, mathematicians over the centuries have decided that uh, it's easy to reason about. Um, data structures or uh, algebras that have these these types of laws. So, yeah, so like they're, they're pretty useful for us, too. Um, yes. And yeah, th th and, yeah this, this kind of brings up the topic of algebras because if all of the core libraries have these uh, concepts of laws that are so important and so essential to their um, to the like these libraries. Um, and it seems like algebra is what those things are. Uh, the types are polymorphic in these uh, core libraries. The operations are the methods on these type classes, and the laws are um, kind of annotated next to them. <laughs> um, yeah, so it'd be, it'd be kind of nice if we can use that for our core applications also. Um, yeah, operations, laws, and we, 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 we bring the types to the table. Yeah, and one thing I'm kind of interested in is, do we really have to, like all the, like most of the type classes that, um, like we have in Prelude, are kind of abstract algebra, or they're kind of heavily inspired by some fields of mathematics, um, but, like, do they have to be from mathematics? As long as they're well considered, and uh, you can you consider how uh, whatever you invent, whatever algebra you invent, invent as, long as, as long as that considers like how it interacts with itself in various situations and composes, and as long as it interacts with, as long as you consider how it interacts with other uh, concepts that you value, then like, why can't you just say it's an algebra too? <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd like to spend some time exploring this in the future in my PureScript projects. Um, instead of coming up with specific data, specific data types first, you can kind of come up with uh, the laws that you want this data type to behave by, and then maybe turn it into a class. Maybe you can do it with the, uh, like the free monad too. I'm not sure, but um, there's ways of defining algebras and like coding them in the PureScript language. So this is something I'd like to explore more, like not data type first, like laws and algebra first. Um, and when it comes to people writing real world, real world applications, I don't hear people at conferences like this or blog posts often talk about this concept. Um, people love talking about algebras, but they don't often talk about making your own algebras. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, this is something I think is very important and I'd like to pass on to people coming after me. 
consider algebras. Uh, but yeah, that's right. Like, if you, I, like, I remember seeing a thread about the default type class in the Haskell community. And like, oh, who's going to maintain it? And some people are saying, maybe we shouldn't maintain it because I don't like it. I'm like, oh, why don't you like it? There's no laws for it. It's not clear how, what, what a valid instance is. Like, yeah, that's true. But like, um, I, I think there was a previous talk about the um, halogen component. And you have to specify all the options up front. Um, and in this instance like that, it's very tempting to just say, any options that has like a default instance. And then like, you, just make it, you just summon a default instance of it. It's kind of tempting to do such a thing. But um, I don't know. It's, like, it's a kind of a trade off. It's terribly useful to have a default type class, right? But is there any algebra behind it? And it's up to you whether you think it's valuable to have algebra behind one of these type classes or not. Mm. Yeah, there's different ways to encode the algebra. Um, like here's one example, kind of using like, this is either the initial, I think this is an initial encoding of an algebra, and then you write an interpreter. It's just like the interpreter pattern. And then you can use type classes for the similar thing. Um, yeah, so a question to think about is like, what kind of situations can we create an algebra in our real applications? Um, yeah, there's a book <laughs> that kind of came across my Twitter stream, like the algebraic models for accounting systems. Um, and they, it, like just reading the table of contents, it's kind of a big book, but it looks like they're able to find exact mathematic uh, things for everything that you need to write a math, an, an accounting system. Um, like I think they use the semi-group and the, uh, or the, mon the monoid stuff, and I think they use, uh, 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 I don't know, it's like, yeah, like, you know, like, a part, like a list and you can partition it, there's a, a mathematical concept for that, like something equality. Um, yeah, but they, yeah, so I mean, for accounting, that's heavily math-based already, so it makes sense to use all sorts of well-studied mathematical concepts. But if, if, if your boss is like giving you business processes, maybe they're not going to exactly correspond to mathematical concepts. And you kind of have to make up your own concept of like a business process that has this property and this property and this property. Right. And so as an example of that, like if you define like a core, a core business algorithm um, in terms of a specific mathematical concept, um, you're kind of tied to that concept for better or worse. Um, so for this example, like if you, wanna, if you have a shopping cart and you want to calculate the order total of it, then you'll just like, <laughs> you can just presume whatever, whatever is in the shopping cart is a monoid instance and you can sum it up. And like that kind of works until like, your business requirements change for that algorithm, and you're going to have to consider different types of cart items, like a coupon cart item or a free shipping cart item, or like th things like this. And then you're going to have to change the state of type a little bit. Um, like maybe you just make it monomorphic, <laughs> or and you add some flags and stuff to say this or like this like this this cart item has this property. This kind of yeah, you can kind of do stuff like that. Um, yeah, otherwise you can just define your own algebra for what a cart item is and come up with your own laws with how cart items, I don't know. But like there's things you can, I didn't spend too much time thinking about this, but uh, yeah, something to think about. Um, all right, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of uh, like algebra stuff, <laughs> kind of designing your, your domain and data types. And then I also want to talk about um, what changes when you move from, when you move into pure, pure FP. Um, and I, when I say move into it, you're going to be coming from somewhere. And where most people come, either from no programming experience or probably from some enterprise programming, high quality stuff like the uh, Java or Scala is not pure FP. I mean, you can, but it's not, yeah. But like, yeah, some languages like this. So, like, what has to change for you to uh, get in the pure FP community? Um, so if, if you kind of consider like what applications looked like before pure FP, um, yeah, I, I don't want to take the time to pull it up, but I, I, I um, wrote a Pong game in pure script, and I didn't know how to do Pong, so I just grabbed somebody's JavaScript application and just kind of translated it directly into pure script, and it worked great. But um, it, it used that same kind of, uh, in the JavaScript implementation, each graphical element, like the ball and the paddles, 
they had their own internal state. <laughs> but I'm not sure exactly how to model that in PureScript. So what I did is I just kept all the states in like one big state atom at the root of my app, kind of like the whatever the Elm model is. And, um, and then I just pass this one state thing through a few different functions that recalculates where the paddle is supposed to go, where the ball is supposed to move, uh, you know, given its velocity and such. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to translate that into pure FP. So you kind of, if you, if you don't know, or if there isn't already a well-studied way of doing, you know, state, like, stateful things like this, then you're going to have a hard time. But anyways, like, like even after I translated it directly into pure script, um, it still looked very similar to the JavaScript, app, JavaScript application. So if you come at, if you come at like a pure FP language with the mindset of programming in a non FP, not like any other language, you, unless you work at it, you're going to be producing the same code as you did before. I mean, yeah, you'll get better type checking, but um, yeah, you'll get better type checking, but you won't. Um, but you you won't be using the full flexibility that a language like PureScript has. It has a very flexible type system. Um, you can do a lot of interesting things with it, but unless you take the time to utilize those, um, you won't be learning too much. You won't be growing as a, as a programmer. There's a lot to learn. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I already said that. What would you have to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, and another thing to note, like, in that Pong game I wrote is I, d I never got rid of, like, the terms, the Pong paddle, like, player one paddle, player two paddle, the ball. I never got rid of those terms, but, um, yeah, so that's going to carry into a later part of this talk, which is um, maybe you, you don't want to get rid of these terms. Like, these, these, these domain terms are very important. Um, yeah, and then now to talk about like what do like what is learning path like when you come into a pure FP language? Like I said, like four or five years ago, when I first came into the pure FP, I went Haskell first because it's. Uh, the most pure, you'll learn the most if you can figure out Haskell, is what I was, I had that impression. But it's very dense, like I said, so you dive in and you kind of skid right off. And then once you kind of understand what the surface tension for this new concept is like, you can kind of readjust your, your plan and you can get in there, you can get in there, it's fine. You'll, you'll get into the pure FP community, uh, the concepts and such. But what is this kind of surface tension, like what is, what is the density? The density is like, it's curried functions. It's, you don't have that in like a lot of other languages. Curried functions by default, uh, like the type checker, it gives you errors in a slightly different way. You'll get different types of errors. Um, you have to kind of, every error kind of has its own explanation. Um, oh yeah. Well, it, uh, it, I wonder if I can just do my other talk, because I was going to do another talk like in five minutes, but I kind of want to talk about this more. <laughs> Yeah, the next one's mine too. Okay. Um, yeah, but like, so the error message will be, will be different. Um, they are very, uh, like they'll give, they'll give reasons like impredicativity. And like, I want to do this, why can't I do this? And like impredicativity is, there, is the answer why you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, you can click on like a link now to go to a wiki page, which will kind of tell you about the error, um, which is nice. And it'll also tell you how to fix it. Um, and, and, and hopefully this is a way that can educate you about reasons why code is right or wrong. So this is, like the type checkers, it can be a, a, a hurdle. Um, and also the explicit side effects. Like there's like all, like all yeah, we all, I think most people are kind of aware of like the complexities, the difficulties of learning at PRFP. Um, but most importantly, I mean the, the language itself is relatively tractable. But if you ever enter a code base as PRFP, you're going to have a lot of problems unless you understand <laughs> like abstract algebra stuff. Like in, the, like in the prelude, like, and core libraries. You're going to have a lot of trouble unless you understand these things. So, like, the thing I want to point out about this is, 
is these abstract algebra things unique to pure FP, or do other languages have these also? Just not exactly abstract algebra. I, I, like, I think that languages, uh, well, other languages have these things you must learn. <laughs> but they don't call them like functor and monoid and stuff. Um, and like, like, just to give an example, like in, in Java, the, 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 sim the, the similar thing in Java is like the patterns, like the, the factory pattern and the visitor pattern and all these different things. They had, they had different names back then, but they still, they still have the same concept. And the difference between PureFP, like the pure script, and like writing something in Java is that um, you've got to know these patterns up front. Like the patterns are used everywhere. Whereas like in a Java language um, where they have these other patterns, Sometimes people use them all over the place. Sometimes, because whatever, they're young programmers and they're told patterns are good. Um, but other times, um, yeah. But these patterns exist in all languages. It's just that in PureFP, we use them everywhere. Um, at least in the libraries do. Right, so that, yeah, so that, that, that kind of brings me back to the point that um, in PureFP, we talk about these universally applicable patterns that's exclusively what we talk about. Like at the conferences, like that's exclusively what we talk about is all these um, dense patterns that people quote unquote need to learn. Um, whereas like in OO land, they talk about patterns, but they also talk about like architecture things, right? Like domain driven design and bounded contexts. And um, there's, other, there's other types of architecture like I don't know, microservices and like where, where do you draw your boundaries? But like we don't, I don't, I don't pe hear people talk about that in FP land, and that's really interesting. Like I just want to point out this absence of a thing, but I want people to know that it's still important. Like I pointed out in that uh, Pong game I wrote, I still had the terms paddle, player one paddle, player two paddle, the ball, um, because like anybody who comes later, that's like going to be what like that, that's going to be their handles into this code base. Is like they know that this concept exists in there somewhere. So if they just search for it, they'll find it. And then once they have that, they already have some intuition about what it should be doing. So like this kind of concept of um, application specific terms, application specific ideas, is something that's not commonly talked about in PFP land. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious why. <laughs> um, this has led me to become rather interested in going back to OO land to read about their practices of domain, like architectural practices, domain driven design. And um, there is some people in the, in the pure FP community that uh, have kind of taken this domain driven design and they kind of morphed it. And I think they call it like algebraic design, algebraic de driven design. So this is interesting. Um, yeah, um, I'm planning to learn more about this and see if this can improve my applications. So the type-driven design. Type-driven design. Is that architectural type-driven design? Yeah. What is what is architecture to you? Architecture? I, I would think not, because I would think that um, architecture, the essential aspect of architecture is boundaries and um, naming things that are essential to your domain and choosing the properties of these domain things. Okay. I think this is the essential aspect of architecture. And to, what's that? Mm -hmm. You think it sounds exactly like uh, what data types and functions are? Yeah, but but the data types and functions don't they, they don't tell you where boundaries are. It's like like in in my 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 website, right? It's just a single page app. So it kind of makes sense to put a boundary in the browser part of it, 
and then the server side of it. Mm-hmm. Like architecture is something we invent ourselves and we have these lines in there. Mm -hmm. like it doesn't need to be that either. So let's say arbitra architecture is something you've arbitrarily come up with and say, I'm gonna constrain my thought to this side of the ear that I need to deal with. Mm -hmm. So you, you 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 think that uh, architecture might not be necessary in FP land? Yeah. Right? That's a pattern to follow, right? That's saying, hey, your business stuff can be completely pure. The middle part of your app sort of has to deal with the I.O. world or the tech world. That's the initial part. That's where you kind of get bootstrapped. Right? That, to me, is enough distinction for all the different parts that you might have in your application or server process or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does it need to be more than that? I think that just depends on your domain. Yeah, so the the three, the three layer pattern um, that Matt has written about, For it's it's a, it's a nice one. Mm -hmm. That's good enough. But in terms of like your domain, that's unconstrained. You can create as many layers as as you need to. Mm -hmm. so I think I don't know. Like in the other world, they just kind of come up with random shit there on the wall because they can't do anything with their language. So you have to invent all these different ways of like saying. This thing is actually this thing over here, and we can't do it over here because we can't express any of that in sort of type. So, so, so you think that like the the study of architecture in OOLand is kind of uh, necess necessary yeah. be because their language is not as expressive? Yeah. That's possibly true, <laughs> but I just like more people to talk about it. Yeah. There was a there was an interesting podcast interview with uh, with a guy named uh, Debatcher's Coach. Um, yeah, I like him. Nice. He's got cool ideas. Yeah. 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 So yeah, the the boss's gosh um, has been one of my inspirations for this idea that it might be important. Um, there's also um, yeah he's written a book. Um, it's I'll, actually I'll, I'll get it once I op once my reading list opens up. Um, uh, there's also a, a, a person in the F sharp F sharp community who has a nice book. I've I've gotten through the introduction which explains domain the uh, motivation behind domain, domain driven design. But his book is about you know domain driven design in uh, a language like F sharp. Um, Denotational semantics. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah, semantic, semantic. Is is that what was the name for that? Denotational design, right? Denotational semantics. I looked into it. It's kind of hard to find resources which clarify exactly what it is. Uh, and I know there's a talk by the person who kind of invented that term, like wants to put me into that term. There's a talk by him. Um, uh, but it's like three hours long about like him live coding. He's like, what should we do here? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's useful. About what? Build building it yourselves? DSLs. DSL. DSLs. Oh, that's right. So now you're asking the question of what operational semantics of the DSL. Uh -huh. What does DSL do? So maybe more familiar language for these concepts in FPLAN would be. Uh, there's a the, the question of formalism behind this, and we want to create. The operational semantics of DSLs? Right. Yeah. Like that, that's a cool idea. So, so, right. 
I didn't consider that. Would a DSL be something like this free monad stuff I talked about, like the, like the interpreter pattern? Is this a DSL? Okay. Right. It's like creating a, a second language, yeah. Okay. Did you have a question? Yeah. So if you're using a free monad, you're saying, I'm constraining myself to this world in which I can only do these particular operations. So like, unintuitively, you might be already doing that. And you're sort of creating this vocabulary in, under which you can talk about whatever concept you've abstracted. Over. So maybe the architecture just really depends on who you talk to and what level of detail you're getting into. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, architecture is kind of a wishy-washy term in my mind still. <laughs> um, the kind of way that I've sort of semi-jokingly talked about this is conservation of human suffering, which is that in a lot of languages that, as John was saying, aren't necessarily as expressive, you need to find a way to constrain what people are doing based on architecture patterns and design patterns. But in languages maybe like PureScript or Haskell or Scholar, if you're very careful, you have the ability to encode some of those constraints into the language itself. And so people are more free to do other things. And that, of course, leads to many people taking many different maybe applications and patterns that they want to use to design up like good programs and still be able to build useful things out of it. The problem is that we end up in a scenario where people don't build consensus around the right ways to build applications are outside of saying, use the interpreter pattern or like, use finally tagless to create an algebra to encapsulate your effects. How do you go about designing an algebra? Well, you know, figure it out. Uh, but I, I think that like, I think that there, there, there are good aspects and like it would be really cool to hear more about what appropriate architecture in functional programming languages ends up looking like. Because I don't necessarily think that it ends up being DSLs all the way down. I think that's just as confusing for people to do. Um, but I think that the, the impetus to do it is just not really as high because you can accomplish so much without describing to these design patterns from the beginning. Because if you don't do it in like a, a language where you aren't forced to keep track of the types or the effects, then you're going to find out a couple months later that you built a completely intractable code base. And the only solution is to tear it down and, and rebuild it from scratch. Whereas if you've done something totally intractable in a language like PureScript and Haskell, ripping parts out and replacing it is like an afternoon. Yeah. To figure out what you want to change, it's like, I mean, I, Michael Stoneman was in another talk, and someone said that there was a bug in a core component of the Stack Integrator tool. And he watched the talk and fixed the problem and pushed a fix and rebuilt Stackage in the course of about an hour. He's got superpowers, so that's a whole other thing. But that's something that's very difficult to do when you don't have guarantees from the language. And I think that, that those guarantees build a, an environment in which you don't necessarily feel like you need to ascribe to these design patterns just to build something that will fall down later. So okay, so like an OO land, you say that the design patterns are to are a substitute for some type safety that you could do in code and not necessarily type safety. Well, also type safety, but also to give you a vocabulary in which to talk about things, right? Because the, the languages aren't very expressive in terms of type system. So you have to use other terminology to say, hey, what am I actually doing with this thing? Oh, let me encapsulate into that into a word, and now let's use flywheel pattern or what the hell ever pattern you want to talk about. Uh huh. I don't think that like FP is devoid of good architecture pattern. I think that's blog post on like the three layer Haskell cake or whatever he calls it is a good example of how common terminology around a particular architecture pattern is useful. But I think the reason why you get away with not having this much more than other community do is because you're not going to end up with a complete mess if you don't follow some of these patterns. Whereas if you're passing around a lot of like explicit mutation or okay. like being able to side effect wherever, if you're not keeping to some kind of pattern or you're not applying the discipline yourself, because a compiler or a type system can't do that, yeah. then, then you're just not going to be able to accomplish anything. Right? Okay. At least not anything you're going to be able to reuse later. Right? So you, you say that like in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an OLAND, like where the type checkers are a little bit less friendly, the type checkers there, um, the patterns are used to prevent you from, pre prevent your code base from falling into 
in, in like un, uh, uh, unmaintainable land, right? Um, but wh whereas in, in FP land, then uh, we can use algebras instead of whatever else. Well, I don't even mean algebras. I mean, like, what is an architecture pattern but a constraint on the way that we want to express the idea in code? And yeah. An architecture pattern is a constraint that we ourselves have developed and are trusting ourselves to be internally consistent and applying throughout the application. And what is a compiler and a good type checking system but a series of internally consistent constraints that we can use to construct like a language of a program in a way that we know is correct based on how the compiler can determine it. I think that right. I, don't, I think that architecture is good. I would, I would hesitate to say that we use algebras as opposed to other architectures. I just think that we can get away with having a less formalized set of terminology around architecture and FP because we have at least some guarantee of internal consistency that other people might not have. I think that architecture and other languages are a way of guaranteeing internal consistency if you follow a pattern. Yeah. Because they're developed by people and because they're developed like somewhat ad hoc to solve a particular problem rather than developed like a type checker is to solve the problem of communicating in code. That's why you have so many competing different architectures because you can't have one size fits all when you are when you don't have like a Internal consistency is the word I guess I keep coming back to because that's yeah. the hard thing for me to keep track of when I write code. So like, like in, in o, you say in OO land that um, these patterns are used for um, internal consistency rather than any language. Any language. language. So not just OO land. Any language where you don't necessarily have a way of developing some kind of formalism over how your code interacts with itself. You fall back to design patterns where you constrain how a person can create code in such a way that it's consistent with itself. That's just my take. I'm not an expert okay. on anything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, I'm not, not an expert by any means either. Um, okay. uh, one, uh, one of the things uh, I'd like to add to is um, architecture feels to me like uh, the boundaries of the system where like one team is working on one code base and another team is working on another code base, but those two uh, have to interact in some fashion. Um, uh, the thing I'd like an answer to, you know, maybe this would be a future Lambda to uh, topic, uh, if anybody knows, is uh, listening to somebody who's worked on, say, a Haskell code base that's older than five years, you know, that's 100,000 lines of code, 500,000 lines of code, multiple teams, that kind of a thing. Um, I'd be, uh, you know, maybe maybe we're not there yet uh, as, a, as a community, but uh, that's the kind of thing that I'd be interested in hearing about. Yeah. Hearing about extra large Haskell applications and multiple teams on it and seeing how design changes. Yeah, that sounds interesting, right? I think I'm not 100% sure, but it might be worth checking out uh, Don Stewart did a talk at the Haskell Exchange, I believe, a year or two ago, where he talked about some of the work that was done at Standard Charter, which is one of the larger, if not the largest, Haskell code data systems. Something like over a million lines of code in Haskell, something like two million lines of code in the Haskell-like uh, like language that they built internally. Um, and they talked, I think, a little bit about this. Uh, Don, Don, Don Stewart at Standard Charter did something. He was at Standard Charter, now he's at Facebook. But yeah. At the time he was talking about what the experience of working with Haskell a little bit was like in production, because I don't think they want to talk very much. Was it a blog post or a book or it, a conference talk? A, a keynote for Haskell Exchange. A keynote for Haskell Exchange? Mm -hmm. I think you look up the video. Okay. So, uh, one more question for you. So, so is FRP for you an uh, FRP? An architectural pattern? Uh, I, 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 it doesn't feel like it. I, I don't know. I can't answer why. It's FRP. It's common ground between lots of, you know, between React and, uh, you know, and the uh, other, right? And mm -hmm. the architecture. Mm -hmm. you know, well, it's the architecture. Yeah. I'd say that that's a, like a form of design rather than <laughs> some architecture. Like, uh, it, I don't know. I guess it kind of is in a certain way, but for a different purpose. Rather than for bound, like rather than for de defining certain context, it's a it's an architecture for accomplishing a certain task. Right. Fair to understand what it means to be architectural pattern. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, but you have other things. You have things like what is a function? Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, that the that the topology is used to to study manifolds using groups. Right. Mm -hmm. And something that I use when writing code. Now that's a huge pattern because it's shared between uh, mathematicians, logicians, and programmers. Right? Is it architectural? I don't know. Mm -hmm.
functors might be architectural because it's cross boundaries. Like lots of different types of people can understand it. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a fuzzy definition, right? I should have defined what architecture is, but uh, yeah. <laughs> code or thoughts or ideas in like a one or two or three module way? Like how do you make sure that ideas can flow in like a single program or a single library, whereas you've got like these larger ideas of what makes architecture, which is how do two different teams maybe work on code that, that, is, that exists in separate modules or libraries but communicate? So mm -hmm. it be different architectural design patterns. Like API design is going to be different from like maybe how you structure your code in a you know, three-layer cake style. Architecture is somewhat like, like a, a code structure, code structuring thing. Well, I mean, it, it can be either. So, like, I think FRP can be like a, an architectural pattern, in as much as that's how you're maybe working through code in a, in a small sense. But it's not like a, an architectural pattern in like how do you get multiple different disparate modules and libraries to communicate with each other? Because there you have to put a border somewhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we should probably get going. I don't have much time left here. Um, yeah. So, like, anyways, like. Well, if we say that architecture is like about bound, like naming things and or bound or whatever it is, and I don't know, algebra kind of comes up again. <laughs> um, like okay, then here's here, here's a fun topic: is principled, like let, let, let's be principled programmers. Um, like John had like a John DeGos had a tweet about um, principledness, like unprincipled designs have shaky foundations and require ad hoc patches. And I was like, I got really curious, like what is what is principled here? What does it mean to be unprincipled? Um, yeah. So I was listening to this, the Freakonomics podcast, and this guy started talking about principledness. At the same time, I was wondering, like, what his principle means? And I was like, oh, this is so perfect. And his answer is kind of like in line with what I think that uh, John means when we talk about principled FP, principled programming, which is that um, they're like recipes for success that have worked for people. Um, it's like a, a set of values that seem to work for somebody. Yeah. So like, so so now for me, whenever I hear somebody that talks about writing principled FP code, um, I think about like, okay, what set of values, which which principles are they thinking is peer, is good FP code, um, and like I, I don't I don't see that list anywhere. Like, it'd be kind of nice for a peer script community to like have some list about what they think is, you know, uh, principled peer functional programming, um, but. For right now, it's kind of everyone kind of has their own idea. Is does anybody here know like what the list of peer like peer FP principles are? Yeah. Foundation of software development. Software foundations. A book. Certifiable, certifiable programs. Yeah. So I think this is the ultimate goal, to be able to certify software correctness. Certify software correctness, yeah. For some, def for some definition of correctness. <laughs> well, well that, that's actually for my part. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that, that would probably be the ultimate goal of what it means to be really good. Right? And also, the, the, what is functional programming? There are several definitions. One of them is functional program. It's a referentially transparent expression made out of a smaller referentially transparent. Yeah, referentially transparentness. That's probably definitely a functional, purely functional so principle. So it's here, it's a relatively good definition of what it means to be functional. Mm -hmm. I, I think so too. Is, is something that can be expressed as one of the mm -hmm. Or uh, using, using other calculators. It doesn't make them to be one of the Mm -hmm. And what it means to be properly functional, or purely functional. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, John gave a follow-up tweet a little bit later about <laughs> some, some, some of his understandings of what the principles of FB are, which is like orthogonal compositionality or composability, um, maximum polymorphism, maximum deferment. I mean, these are all pretty good aspects, pretty good principles for some software system, right? Kind of. Kind of hard to say no. I don't want that. 
Um, but I still feel there's more. Like you didn't talk about referential transparency here. I mean, it's kind of implied in order to in order to have one of these things, but not explicitly listed there. But this is at, at least he has some you know pointer towards what it is. Yeah, and and it's it's very easy with like without like some central list of like what a certain you know, practice like practice in your community. Like even if it's inside of your single company, it'd be nice to have like a set of principles that you kind of choose to program around. Um, and then an interesting thing is that later he talked about um, principled FP again, but I couldn't quite figure out which principle he was talking about here. It's like the, like bifunctor IO. <laughs> like which, which principle means that bifunctor IO is great? Yeah. Performs fast? Is that like? Um, they said that errors are very fine. So in, in IO, otherwise you have potential errors that just are not in the type system. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on what you want I/O to be. Like, if you want I/O to be just an arbitrary effect, and if you want to catch exceptions in your in your code, then um, you could nest this either thing inside of I/O. Like, th this seems more principled to me. Like, keep these things separate. Um, but yeah, it's it's arguable. I I just want to say that like I, d I disagree, and it's kind of weird that you said that this is the principle of you know this is principle programming in FP. I I think this is interesting. <laughs> I don't want to dwell on this one too, for too long. Um, yeah. And then, like, I just had, like, a few other s s smaller topics. Um, one is about effects. Like, right now in PureScript, we only have, like, this base effect. <laughs> um, we used to have the rows, but we're kind of getting rid of those now. Um, and, like, all these different functions, they just return effect, which is, like Alejandro was saying at his keynote the other day, he had a keynote about effects and how, like th this IO type, this I effect type, is very wide. It really doesn't explain anything to you. Um, so, like in my mind, the only reason you'd want to have um, the effect type be your only effect type is for performance sake, because it can be optimized away in the PageScript compiler to be just a sequence of native JavaScript calls without any binding function between them. Um, but like if you want, if you want to be very principled, in my mind, you'd have more specific uh, effects that have some algebraic laws around uh, what those effects do, how they interact with itself, with other effects of itself, or with other effects, period. I don't know, more thinking around this. But right now, we have the, we have the extensible effects thing, which is kind of getting in that direction. Well, yeah, it depends on what you want to track in the type system. Mm -hmm. At some point, there's a cutoff. As to well, don't, like be, because it can't be perfect, doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but like, to make it good. But then how much overhead do you want? I mean, mentally, yeah. like maintaining large PostScript projects that have that row effect stuff is like really it's covered. It's more covered. Oh, I hate the row thing. Yeah, this is not about the row thing. No, but this is about the row, like the effect kind. Is what you're saying related to that more? Yeah. Like they did this for reasons because it's really terrible. Well, for having lots of fine-grained ones, maybe. But you, maybe you have just two or three, and you'll be fine. The problem is also that everybody can make their own. And now yeah. the real problem is you end up having like, three different exception types that like, somebody's throwing. That's, like, really that's, that's, that's the same thing with using any ecosystem. Is like, that, like, like if you use the prelude and like, whatever the community ecosystem is, like, the, you have to choose libraries in the ecosystem that kind of don't overlap. Unfortunately, like, it's just, in that, it just like, empirically, it turned out to be a really bad idea because you couldn't compute with them either. And it was like, what is the real point of this? It's just some string, effectively, that like labels it. I'm happy about it. Like, uh -huh. It's just some tracking. Yeah, yeah so we, we, like, we ended up kind of implementing something like effect anyway, because eventually we just got tired of kind of juggling all the different effect rows, and then you have to unify them all at like the top layer anyway. Yeah. And right. Then, so we, ba we basically just like define a top level effect row as a type alias, and just use that everywhere, everywhere. just to yeah. kind of- Top level effect row. Yeah. Yeah, but I think there's a middle ground between having the effect row and having no eff and having no grained effects. Yeah, but like, you can do this with like variant or there are other ways to do this now. Like you can still have this thing. It's right. Just not that you want another right. I, I just haven't heard much. Many people talk about yes, we're good. This is the the way to go. Like like it's way good to do some fine grained effects, like some grain. Yeah, I mean it's. I, I get why they went with that direction initially. Like it sounds good to yeah. say like okay, well. You know this this function 
And like, it's not just going to return an effect, it's going to return like a DOM effect. So it gives you some more insight into specifically what is this function, like what is the effect this function is going to perform, like what are you going to do. But I think, yeah, like you said, in practice, it just ended up being more cumbersome than it was really worth. Yeah. Yeah. It was democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, PureScript has one too. Extensible effect. That's pretty nice. Uh, right. Right, so. <laughs> yeah. I only have two things. I don't want to like, take more time, but the one thing is the way I see this effect change being useful is it turns effect into like a primitive that you can build off of to say this is the border between safe code and unsafe, or like an effective code. Yeah. And then don't try and bin everything into effect in terms of like your architecture pattern, for example, maybe trying to track what's doing what. Yeah. And then you can lean on things like an effect around a new type of some primitive represents a DOM. Like, a, if you're returning some string information from a DOM, it's uh -huh. an effect around maybe a new type around that string information that says this thing comes from a DOM. Or using libraries like extensible effects to build up. Right. So, like, the, like the effect thing is kind of like the one bo 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 effect boundary, and then you just use some L L uh, like interpreter pattern thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a way you can do things. Yeah. I, I think that's um, mostly helpful. Um, yeah, there's like different ways to do this. Um, yeah, here's some like, if you want to do like, like just have like three or four different types of effects, I don't know, some ideas. The, the, the power I see is like effect and app are like, they're already yeah. worlds better than what I was expecting to get in many languages. Yeah. So like, I'm, I'm fine with that, and then I think everything else you give people the freedom to build on top of it, not to be overly cumbersome. Uh huh. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's that's all I've got to talk about then. Uh, I was, I was going to talk about using the, the 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 sharp sign instead of the dollar sign, but <laughs> yeah.